And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Welcome to this edition of the Street Fishing Podcast. This program is dedicated to going out to the highways and hedges and compelling people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Join your host, Tony Miano, and his team of street fishermen as they find people on the streets with whom to share the gospel. No scripts, no planning, no preparation. Just impromptu gospel conversations with random people out there in a world in desperate need of the Savior. So, until the nets are full, let's go fishing. Good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it might be, wherever you may find yourself. Welcome to another edition of the Street Fishing Podcast. I am your host, Tony Miano, and on today's episode, you are going to hear a conversation with a young lady named Montana. Uh, My son in the faith, Matthew Lincoln, and I were out crosswalking and doing sign evangelism and distributing gospel tracts in downtown Davenport on the corner of 2nd and Gaines right at the Mississippi River, right at the base of the Centennial Bridge, uh, where the bridge crosses the Mississippi River uh, back and forth between Iowa and Illinois. Well, Montana, living on the Illinois side of the river, uh, was driving around, saw us there on the corner, saw the cross that said stop and talk, and decided to stop and talk. Uh, It's about a 48-minute conversation. Uh, I hope you will listen to all of it. I think there's much to be gained from the conversation, not the least of which is simply to be encouraged to hear the gospel and to hear one young lady's response to it. Uh, But before we uh, go to the conversation, uh, I want to remind you that I'd love to hear from you. Email me at streetfishingpodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's streetfishingpodcast at gmail.com. If I answer a question or uh, read uh, your comment, uh, on the on the program, I will uh, send you out a free copy of my book, Take Up the Shield. Love to hear from you. And again, the email address is streetfishingpodcast at gmail.com. All right, I don't want to take any more time. I want to get right to this conversation because it is a long one. And I have quite a bit that I want to do by way of chalk talk following the conversation. So with that, let's go fishing. Oh, what is that smell? Hi. Really which one? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm Tony, and this is Matt. And you are? I'm Montana. Montana. Okay. So, um, well, it's pretty obvious why we're out here. Is there something in particular you'd like to talk about? No, not really. Do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? Um, I really don't know about it, but I just know that there's a God. Okay. That's about it. And what do you think is going to happen to you when you die? Which we hope is 70, 80, 90 years from now. Um, probably go to heaven, I think. And, and, and what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? Um, I mean, not just, like, not be better than someone else. Just realize that everyone's the same and that we're all going, I think. Everyone's going to heaven. Yeah. Okay. Um, So you believe heaven exists. You believe God exists. How about hell? Um, Um, I mean, I don't know where the other people are going to go, but I feel like, I don't know. Because you said everybody's going to heaven. So I wonder, in your mind, who do you think is going to hell? What does someone have to do to go to hell? I don't know. Okay, okay. Um, So I'm going to ask a couple of silly questions, okay? If everybody goes to heaven, will Hitler's room be next to yours? I don't know. Do you think Hitler's in heaven? Um, I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to tell who's really bad or not that's just the way I think Mm. like it's hard for me like someone will literally like people will tell me like why are you hanging with them they're bad I'm like I can't really tell who's bad or who's good just because 
of how things are. So, good relationship with your parents? Oh, yeah. Okay, so someone does something awful to your mother. Good person or bad person? Bad. Someone rapes your mother. Bad. Okay, so you are going from a standard, okay? Mm-hmm. You do believe that there is bad and there is good. Yeah. You can judge between good and evil. So I guess then what we have to figure out is why you don't want to. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna guess because I don't know I don't know your mind I don't know your heart. But in, in talking to a lot of people, I, I think when someone has difficulty seeing evil in others, it's it's because it helps them not to see the evil in themselves. If I don't judge anyone else as evil, I don't have to look at myself. You think God's good? Yeah. Okay. Um, God is described as holy. Uh, means he's perfect. You know, uh, the Bible says that God cannot sin. God cannot lie. He's perfect. He's holy. He's just. He's good in every conceivable way. Everything he does is good. He's completely different than we are. Um, have you ever told a lie? Yeah. Me too. Have you ever stolen anything? Me too. Ever been so angry with someone that you don't say anything, you don't do anything about it, but in your mind, in your heart, you think, you know, I think I hate that person. A lot of that going around today. Um, Ever look at a young man and have a sexual thought you shouldn't have okay ever want something that someone else has just because they have it and you don't okay ever disobey your parents would you say all of those things I just asked you would you say those to not or to to do those things or to not do those things depending on you know which way it goes stealing lying looking with lust hating another person Disobeying your parents. Do you think those things, doing those things are good or bad? Bad. Okay. And you're right. So you clearly, you obviously, you know the difference between right and wrong. The reason you know the difference between right and wrong is because the God you know exists, wrote his law on your heart. He's given you a conscience. You and I know the difference between right and wrong in the same way and for the same reasons. We're very different people, probably come from different backgrounds. We were raised by different parents. We're different generations. You know, you're certainly young enough to be my daughter, if not my granddaughter. Um, Different walks of life, different educations. We're different. But even though we're so different, You and I both know God exists, and God's written the same law on both of our hearts. You and I both know it's wrong to lie, not because our parents told us. Some parents tell their kids, hey, lie whenever you can, get whatever you can get. There are entire cultures of people that that raise their children to steal, that cultures uh, to steal, to, to swindle people, to con people. There are entire cultures of people that say that's okay. But yet, every one of them knows that what they're doing is wrong. The reason you and I know it's wrong to lie is because the God who created us isn't a liar, and he wrote his law in our heart. Uh, The God who created us isn't a thief. That's why we know it's wrong to steal. Um, He's not a murderer at heart. That's why we know it's wrong to hate. Hatred, Hatred begins in the heart moves to the mind where maybe we formulate a plan and then to the hand where we maybe we do or maybe we don't carry out the act but God said God says in his word whoever hates another person is a murderer so we know the difference between right and wrong because we were created in the image of God the Bible says we are image bearers of, of our creator so Do you think good people lie and steal and disobey their parents and murder and... No. No. And and that's true of all of us. 
Bible says that all have sinned, broken God's law, missed the mark. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have broken his law. Because God is good, because he's holy, um, he's righteous, he's just, he's the perfect judge. Because he's good, when we die and stand before him, he's going to find us guilty of breaking his law. He's not going to just turn a blind eye to our sin. He would stop being holy if he did that. He's going to find us all guilty. Because all of us, either with our mind or our mouths, our hands or our feet, our hearts, we've all broken his law in one way or another. Every day of our life. Yet Jesus said you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's a standard none of us can live up to. But that's what God considers good, moral perfection. All of us have failed. All of us have broken his law. And because of that, God will rightly find us all guilty when we stand before him, if we are judged according to his law. And because God is good, he's got to punish that sin. Let's go back to the person who raped your mom. And I hope that never happened. Okay, good. So that person gets caught. They're standing before the judge in the courtroom. They've been found guilty. Not a case of mistaken identity. DNA evidence. Your mother identifies him as the person. Jury finds him guilty. Not a corrupt cop just looking for an arrest. Not a corrupt judge just looking to throw someone in prison. This person confesses to the crime. And so it's the day of sentencing. You, your mom, the rest of your family her friends, loved ones, you're all there in the courtroom and you're expecting justice. You're expecting the judge to do the right thing. And so the judge asks this person who violated your mom, you've been found guilty before I post sentence, what do you have to say for yourself? And he says, I know that was wrong, I should have never done it. Um, And I promise I'm never going to do it again. And I think you're a good judge, so I think you ought to let me go. And you're all shaking your head. And the judge says, okay, you're free to go. Good judge or bad judge? Uh, I mean... I guess bad judge because he didn't really get punished? Right, the judge didn't follow the requirements of the law. The judge let a guilty person go with no punishment just because the person wanted to be let go. God, who is the perfect judge of the universe, is not going to let anybody go who has broken his law. There has to be a punishment for that crime. Does that make sense? And the punishment God has determined for sin, all of it, whether it's lying to your mom about where you've been or putting a bullet in the back of someone's head the punishment God has determined for all sin is eternity in hell because he's holy and no sin can be in his presence so that's bad news from a good God a good judge that's bad news for us if when we die All God sees is our crimes against him, our sin against him. But yet, this same God who's literally angry with the wicked every day, who will judge the world in righteousness, is also loving and merciful and gracious and kind. He has made a way for guilty criminals like us, meaning we've broken God's law, he has made a way for guilty criminals like us to go free without him being a corrupt judge. Any idea how he did that? Um, by repenting? Well, no. Um, let's go back to that courtroom. The, the man who violated your mom repented before the judge. He said, I'm guilty. I admit to the crime, it was wrong, and I'm going to turn away from that, and I'm going to do my best to never do it again. 
judge wouldn't be light, right for letting him go just because the man repented. That, that wouldn't be justice. Repentance, there, repentance is involved, but it's not repentance that causes God to set us free. Because someone still has to pay the penalty for the crime. You know, I, I was actually a police officer for 20 years. And I never experienced someone being let go because they confessed to a crime. It was actually more evidence against them to prove that they're guilty and they should go to jail. Confession never sets anybody free. It just proves they're guilty. Okay? So now let's go back to this courtroom. Let's say now it's Montana in court. We'll move away from this case with your mom and this person who hurt your mom. You're now the guilty criminal before the judge. And the judge says, Montana, having found you guilty, I sentence you to death for your crime. And so the judge is going to have you taken into the next room, strapped to a gurney and put to sleep like a stray dog as the just punishment for the crime you committed, whatever that might be. But before he does that, he stands up from behind his bench. He takes off those black robes of authority. He steps down and he says, Montana, I've found you guilty and you deserve to die for this crime, but I'm going, but I'm going to take your place. And so the judge allows himself to be escorted into the ne next room He's strapped to the gurney. He's put to sleep for a stray by, as a stray dog, not for a crime he committed, but to take your place for the crime that you've committed. The requirement of the law was that someone died as the penalty for the crime you committed. And the judge took your place and you're set free. What would you think of that judge? Yeah. That's a picture of what God actually did. 2,000 years ago, thereabouts, God the Father sent His Son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, without sin. Unlike you and me, He never once broke God's law in thought, word, or deed. He could not because He was perfect. He was God in the flesh. He didn't know sin. He never committed sin the way we did, we have, the way we do every day. But yet, even though he was perfect, even though he was innocent, he voluntarily submitted himself to death on a Roman cross, where he suffered and died a death he did not deserve, to take upon himself the punishment people like you and I rightly deserve for our crimes against God. And then he forever defeated sin and death when he rose from the grave three days later. God says in his word that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. And he also says that he will save those who are guilty. The only way he can do that without contradicting himself is if he takes upon himself the punishment people like us deserve for our crimes. And so God the Father made him God the Son who knew no sin to literally become sin on behalf of those who by faith would receive him so that when God sees them, he sees the righteousness of his Son instead of seeing our sin. God the Father allowed his perfect and precious and priceless Son to die a death he did not deserve so that sinners like us who deserve nothing but death can be set free so that we can have the assurance of forgiveness and the assurance of eternal life in heaven. And so what God commands for us, from us in response to that, to that gift, the Bible des describes it as a, a free gift. It says the, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What God commands of us is not simply to believe that in our head, but to believe in our heart. The Bible says that we literally must be born again. Have you ever heard that term? It literally means to be born from above. 
And so if God does that miraculous work in you, Montana, as he's done for so many others, and literally causes you to be born again, he will take a heart of stone that at the moment has you as an enemy of God, and he will give you a heart of flesh. He'll literally adopt you as one of his children through faith in his son. And as a result, you will repent. You will turn from your sin. You will begin to live and to think and to talk differently, not to earn God's love, not to keep God's love, but because you're so thankful for the love that God has given you through the sacrifice of his son. So yes, you will repent, but not in order to be forgiven, not as a work leading to salvation, but as a fruit, as a result of salvation. You'll repent, you'll turn from your sin and turn toward Christ, and you will believe in your heart the gospel you've heard today. And the result of that will be forgiveness. Everything you've ever done, every time you've broken God's law in your heart, in your mind, with your mouth, with your hands, with your feet, every crime you've ever committed against God will be forgiven, not because you're good, but because of the goodness of God that would allow His Son to die in your place and to take the punishment you deserve. He'll not only forgive your sin, but He will forget it. He'll remember it no more, the Bible says. He'll remove it as far as the east is from the west, and he'll remember it no more. You'll receive forgiveness. You'll be reconciled to the God you have spent your life offending by your sin, and you will be adopted by him as a beloved daughter. He'll no longer be your judge, but he will be your father. And you'll have the assurance of eternal life that when you do leave this world, when you do leave this life, what you have to look forward to is eternity with the God who saved you, worshiping at the feet of the one who died on behalf of your sin, Jesus Christ the Lord. None of us are good. All of us deserve God's punishment for our sins. But God is so gracious and loving and kind that he allowed his one and only son to die on behalf of sinners like us and if we will but humble ourselves and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior he will forgive our sin and we'll have the assurance of eternal life that's the good news of the gospel so I've talked a lot what what are you thinking got from it that you have to basically want to do the right thing for the right thing to basically come out of you. Basically. You can't just want to do it because you want to get to heaven. So you have to just want to do it for yourself in order to be a better person. Well, not exactly. The goal is not to be a better person. Uh, that's what the world would tell us. You know, get education, get legislation, get med- medication, do whatever you have to do to, to Be all you can be, to be a good person, to be a contributor to society. When we stand before God, none of that will help us. Because the Word of God says that all of our good works are filthy rags to a holy God. And the Bible says that God can't be bribed. And so when we try to work our way into heaven, whether it's through religion or cleaning up our act, or turning over a new leaf, or however we, the world wants to put it, we're basically trying to bribe the judge not to hold us accountable for our sin. But here, look, I've done all of these things now, and so I want you to forget about my sin, and I want you to accept me as one of your children because of all the stuff I've done. That won't help us. Think of it this way. Let's say, you were my, let's say you were my neighbor, and one day you knock on my door and you say, hey, Tony, I want to mow your lawn so that I could be your daughter. I'm going to say thank you for wanting to get me out of yard work. And I'm going to say I think it's sweet. I think it's pretty special that you want to be my daughter, but Montana mowing my lawn isn't going to make you my daughter. 
But what if you actually were my daughter? And I come home one day and I see Montana mowing the lawn. I think, well, Montana usually doesn't do that. What's up? What's wrong? Thinking like a skeptical parent. And you see me and you come running over and you say, yeah, Dad, I'm mowing the lawn today. Um, no, I don't want any money out of your wallet. I don't want the keys to the car. Um, I don't got a bad report card from school. Um, I don't have any bad news to give you. I'm mowing the lawn, Dad, because I love you and I'm thankful that you're my father. That'll make most grown men cry. When we die and we stand before God, telling God that look at all of these things I've done will not help us. He's not going to forgive our sin and adopt us as his children because of these works that we've tried to do to please him. But if God, and the Bible says salvation is entirely of the Lord, but if God chooses to adopt us, giving us those gifts of repentance and faith in Jesus, we will want to live a life pleasing to him, not to earn his love, but because we're so thankful for the love that he gave us. Um, I have a nephew and two nieces who are all adopted from Africa. They didn't choose my sister and brother-in-law to be their parents. They didn't demand that my brother and si my sister and brother-in-law adopt them. They, they're little babies. They had no authority to do that at all, right? There was nothing they could do to earn my family's love. Nothing they could do to work their way into our family. They couldn't decide for themselves that, you know what, I think today I'm going to be part of this family and make them fly 8,000, 10,000 miles to come and get me. No, my family chose to adopt them into the family. That's what God does with the people he saves. He literally gives us a new name, new clothes, and a new home. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, not by our work, but by his, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and he adopts us into, our fam into his family, he gives us a new name. We're no longer called wretched sinner. We're no longer called condemned. We're no longer called hell-bound. We're now called a beloved child of God. We're now called redeemed. We're now called forgiven. We're now called loved. Because God adopted us. He gives us new clothes. We're no longer wearing the filthy clothes of our sin and our law-breaking. We're now clothed in the righteousness and the goodness of his son Jesus. So he no longer sees our filthy rags of our sin. He sees now the pure garments of his son covering us. And he gives us a new home. Our home is no longer this world, while we certainly live here for now, but this is not our home. Our final destination is no longer hell as the just punishment for our sin. Our, our home is now heaven. And we're simply awaiting to go there. All because of the work God did in our lives to adopt us as his children through faith in his son. So the message isn't do the best you can and maybe it'll work out for you. The message is, Montana, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. There's nothing you can do to force God to love you and adopt you as one of his daughters. Because it's a free gift. If I was wearing a watch and I said, I'm going to give you my watch as a gift. And you take my watch. And as you're putting it on your wrist, I say, that'll be $300. Still a gift? No, because there's something you had to do to pay for it or to earn it. But salvation is a free gift. The world's religions, and you can name any of them, they all basically say the same thing. You do have to work your way into the good graces of this God that we believe in. And, he, and you can never be certain that you do enough. And so you hope for the best with no real reason to hope. What the Bible teaches is the exact opposite. We can have real hope because we can be assured of real forgiveness 
and real reconciliation with God because the real God who created us really sent his son to earth to die on behalf of real sinners like us. If we really put our faith and our trust in him alone for our salvation, he will really save us and really keep us and really love us. And so we can have real hope and real assurance, not because of anything we do, but because of the goodness of God that would allow his son to die for sinners like us. Heaven and hell are real places, and we're really going to spend all of eternity in one of those two places. And God has provided only one way for us to be reconciled to him. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's only one way that God has made for us to be reconciled to him. We have to come to God on his terms because God doesn't negotiate with sinners any more than a good judge would negotiate with a man who hurt your mother. The convicted criminal doesn't make the rules. The convicted criminal suffers as a result of those rules. But God, again, being so loving and kind for those who will put their faith and their trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, He will forgive their sin. He will no longer be their judge. He will now be their Father forever. That's good news. Now what are you thinking? I think that we have to believe in Jesus. Yeah. And, and believe in our heart. Believe that he died for our sin. Believe that, that he was who he said he was and is. God in the flesh. Believe that he not only died on the cross, but rose from the grave. Believing that it's only through his work that any of us can be saved. The Bible says a broken and contrite heart, a heart that's broken over its sin, a heart that's broken over the broken relationship they have with God, God will not turn away. If you will believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. He will save you. And he will forgive your sin. Is there any sin in your life? And if there is, you don't have to tell me what it is, okay? But is there any sin in your life that you love so much, that you want so much, that you won't let go of? That you're willing to die and spend eternity in hell instead of receive the free gift you're being offered today. Well, I don't want to die, but it's a problem because um, it's my sexuality. So I just don't feel the way I feel about how I'm supposed to feel. So I'm just like, I think about it every day when I'm like looking at people and I'm just like, I'm supposed to feel something right there, but I don't. But over here I do. So I'm just like, that's the only thing really that... So, I'm uncomfortable with Okay, so when you say you're uncomfortable with, is that because that's something you don't want to give up? No, or I because just, that's something you know is wrong, but you're struggling to give that up? Yeah, I feel bad. Okay. Like, okay. after they leave, I'm like, that was really bad, and that was really wrong, and I don't know. But then when they get there, I'm just like, I forget about it. But after the fact, I'm just like, that's bad. I'm not supposed to do that right. I don't know. So here's some encouragement regarding that. God changes a person from the inside out. Okay? And the fight you're fighting now on your own is a fight you can never win. Because you were born with a sin nature. That's all you can do is sin. But when God causes you to be born again and he fills you with his spirit, not only does he take away the punishment for the sin, but he also gives you the ability to conquer that sin through faith in Christ. That could happen overnight. That might be a battle for years. But the forgiveness doesn't come from conquering the sin. The forgiveness comes as a free gift and, and, and you're given a new heart with new desires 
and the things you once loved that you knew were contrary to God's word, God's design, the things you once loved, you now hate and you don't want to do them. And, and when you fall, when you fail, you don't stay in that place. You remember that Christ died for your sins. You look to the cross and not to your performance. And he gives you the will and the desire to battle that sin. And victory can and will come over that sin through Christ's victory on the cross. A lot of people think that, well, once I clean up my act or once I stop doing the things I know I shouldn't do, then I'll come to Jesus. You're putting the cart before the horse because the very thing you want to stop, you can't because the Spirit of God doesn't indwell you. It's God who does the work in our hearts. It's God who changes our hearts. It's God. It's God who gives us it's God who gives us the faith and the love for God and the hatred of sin that enables us and allows us to conquer those sins. Jesus said, I did not come, I, I did not come for the righteous, but the unrighteous. I did not come for the healthy, but for the sick. Where people get themselves in trouble is they think that they can make themselves righteous and acceptable before God instead of humbly coming before him and saying, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. See, I, I, Montana, I know I'm going to heaven not because of who I am, but in spite of who I am. God doesn't just love me the way I am and then leave me there. He loved me enough not only to save me, but to change me. That doesn't mean I'm perfect in any way. There were things about my life that when I came to faith in Christ, he immediately took away. Two of them were my mouth. I had a very, very filthy mouth. Um, and I enjoyed talking like a sewer. I did it at work. I did it at home. I did it everywhere. When the Lord saved me, he immediately took that away. Not that I, was, not that I no longer had the ability to do it, but I no longer had the desire to do it. Something else he immediately took away from me was a desire to abuse inmates in the county jail, either verbally or physically. Yeah, I would do that Monday through Saturday, and then I would go to church on Sunday, put a robe on with a cross on it, and sing in the choir. And I thought I was a Christian. But I wasn't. But when God saved me and he changed my heart, I no longer had any desire to do that ever again. There were some things in my life, like things dealing with anger and things like that, um, dealing with being anxious about things or worried about things. Uh, there were things that took a long time for me to conquer, and there's still sin that I'm battling to this day. The difference is, I no longer, I no longer want to do the things I know God hates. I want to do the things I know God loves. And when I fail to do the things that God loves, and I instead do the things that God hates, I don't walk away in despair thinking, oh no, God doesn't love me anymore. Oh, oh no, I'm not going to be forgiven. Oh no, I'm going to hell now. No, I, I remember what Jesus did on the cross. And I, and I look to his sacrifice and the love that God showed me through that sacrifice. And so when I die and I stand before God, and if God were to ask me, Tony, why should I let you into heaven? My answer is, God, if you look only at me and my sin, you shouldn't let me into heaven. I deserve hell. But I believe Jesus died for my sin. And so my trust, my faith, my hope is in what your son did for me on the cross. So Father, I believe that I have eternal life, not because of what I've done, but because of what your son did on my behalf when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. So my trust and my faith and my hope isn't in, in me at all. It's in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that's why I can have hope. That's why I can have forgiveness. That's why I can be assured of eternal life in heaven. 
because of the goodness of God that allowed his son to die for a sinner like me. In Montana, you can have that hope too. But you must die to yourself. Jesus said, who, um, Jesus said, unless we are willing to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, we are not worthy, we're not fit to be his disciples. We literally have to die to ourselves. And we have to die to ourselves. We have to put our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. And we have to count the cost. Montana, everything I'm telling you doesn't mean your life's automatically going to get better. It might get harder, Montana, as friendships change, as way your way of life changes, um, as your priorities change, as you begin to love for Jesus, you, you begin to live for Jesus, who the world hates. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. It might get harder, Montana. But, but if, if God causes us to be born again, if he literally saves us, we will count that cost and we will follow him anyway. Because this is not our home. And because our Father in Heaven loves us and we know we're forgiven and so that no matter what this world throws at us, we can still have hope. We can still have real peace and real joy even in the midst of hardship because we know this isn't all there is. Because we know what awaits us in Heaven is far better than anything we could ever experience here. That's why there are millions of people around the world today literally being killed because they dare to name the name of Jesus. And they do that with a smile on their face because they know to be absent from this body is to be in the presence of the Lord. And so the sins that you're struggling with, the sins you know put you at odds with God, and knowing that if you give those things up, you give that lifestyle up, and you turn away from those, that there could be a real cost for you in your life. If God causes you to be born again and changes your heart and saves you, you will pay that price willingly because you know that the love that God has for you is far better than whatever the world might call love. And He will never leave you or forsake you. You can probably think of right now people who have let you down, people who have hurt you, people who have turned their back on you, people who, who have lied to you, people who you once trusted who you can no longer trust. Every one of us can think of people like that in our lives. That's not God. That's not Jesus. He's perfect, He's good, He's holy, He's righteous, He's just, He's loving, He's merciful, He's kind, He's gracious. And He promises for those who receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, He promises that He will never leave them or forsake them. He will never turn their back. He will never turn His back on them. And the relationship, every human being has a relationship with God. The vast majority of people have a broken relationship with Him. But if we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, that relationship will be mended, it will be renewed, restored. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. You can have everlasting life you can receive forgiveness for your sin if you will but put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Well, thank you. Is, is there any, is there any, look, I don't want you to do anything for me, okay? But hearing all of this, is there any reason why you wouldn't turn from your sin and put your trust in Christ? No, not really. Okay then please, for the sake of your own soul, Jesus said, what is a prophet, a man or a woman, 
if he, if he or she gains the whole world but forfeits their soul? What will a man or woman give in exchange for their soul? Well, to me, not much. Well, and, and if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it won't be anything at all. Yeah. It won't be anything at all. The Word of God says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Look, with everything going on in the world today, we turn on YouTube, we turn on Facebook, we turn on the TV news, and we see every day how fragile life is. The Bible describes life as a mist, as a vapor, literally here today and gone tomorrow. We're not promised our next breath, let alone tomorrow. Now is the time, Montana, for you to get right with the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a coincidence. What made you stop anyways? Were you driving by? Were you just walking? Yeah. yeah? Which way were you coming from? Off the bridge. Off the bridge. So you saw us, you drove all the way around, parked here. What made you stop? Um, um, I don't know. I just was driving and it says stop and talk. So I figured that you could tell me something that I needed to hear. And Do you think that happened? Yeah, a little bit. Just because, like, I go to church and stuff, and I always hear something I need to hear in church, but it's been closed down. So, like, ever since the churches are closed, like, I haven't been hearing things I needed to hear. So I've just been getting lost a little bit. So coming here and talking just kind of helped a little bit to help me get basically back focused, I think. So don't let this conversation be part of the evidence against you when you stand before God. My hope is that this conversation will be what God uses to bring you to real repentance and faith in Him for His glory and for the sake of your soul. I care about you as my neighbor. The last thing I want to see is you perish in your sin. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't save you any more than I can condemn you. But if I care about you as my neighbor, if I care about you as another human being, and I know the way to eternal life, I'd have to hate you to keep that information from you. And I, and I don't. Turn to Christ and live while God's given you time. Okay. Can I give you something to read? That courtroom analogy that we were talking about, that expands on that a little bit more. Okay. You, you, you say you are going to church across the river? Yeah. Well, it's well right. Now. Right. Um, I go to a few of them. Oh, you do? Okay. So, uh, not that far a drive to come on this side of the river, right? No. Oh. Did I give you something else? Did I give you one of these? No. Okay. So, no salesman will come to your door. All the information for our church is there. We're here in Davenport. Okay. And just know the door's open. All right. Okay, all I know is you're Montana, so I'm not going to be knocking on your door or anything. But is, but if you have more... Is open now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Churches here in Iowa are... We have been since uh, since May. So, okay. yeah, we meet on Wednesday night and a couple of times on Sunday. We like to eat. So, we have dinner together on Wednesdays and Sundays. And, and there's numbers there if... You have any other questions or anything like that? But more important than visiting our church, more important than going back to yours, is making sure that if you were to die today, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Okay. And that's only through faith in Christ. I mean, I just want to basically make sure that today I did, well, not did, but today I just accomplished what I need to accomplish with this situation that's that's all I can do is about today and then tomorrow hopefully tomorrow that's I can't because I have to worry too much on the future mm -hmm. about like tomorrow but like I'm just trying to figure out about today and getting through today that's all I'm worried about the only way you're going to get through and have any real hope and not have this entire life be an utter waste of going day to day is if God forgives you for your sin 
and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Otherwise, you're like a hamster running in a wheel. It begins, it begins, it begins with your reconciliation to God. That's where it begins. That's the first step, not the last step. That's the first step. And when God does that work and you do take that first step of receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you're no longer a hamster on a wheel just trying to get by day to day. You're actually living with a purpose to bring glory to the God who created you. I appreciate you giving me so much of your time. I'm really glad you stopped. forward to seeing you whenever that is all right god bless you montana you have a great day all right take care Well, that was my conversation with Montana. Uh, what did you think? What did you like? What did you not like? Uh, was there anything you would have said differently? Something I could have said better? Uh, what encouraged you? What, if anything, convicted you? I'd love to hear from you. Email me at streetfishingpodcast at gmail.com. Streetfishingpodcast at gmail.com. All right, let's get to the uh, chalk talk here. Quite a bit I want to go over with this conversation. Again, it was a long one, uh, but I think a profitable one. Let's start with uh, Montana's spiritual beliefs. Uh, she was basically a universalist, as many people will initially profess to be. They believe, or at least they think they believe, <laughs> that everybody goes to heaven. That if hell exists, it's an empty place. Um, everybody, regardless of what they've done, God being so gracious and merciful and loving, uh, just lets anybody and everybody in to heaven. Uh, when I asked her about hell, you know, she was initially non-committal, really wasn't sure what to think about hell, how to answer. And then I asked Montana, uh, will Hitler's room be next to yours? And I, I find that to be an effective and probative question for those who want to insist that everybody uh, goes to heaven. The reason they think everybody goes to heaven because is because that's where they want to be. They want to go to heaven. And so if they believe everybody goes to heaven, well, then they're in. And so by asking something as simple and even maybe as silly sounding as, will Hitler's room be next to yours in God's mansion? Jesus says he goes to prepare a place for you. The usual answer to that question is, well, no. <laughs> no, I don't think Hitler will uh, be next to me in heaven because they know Hitler was evil. I then talked to Montana, um, asking her about what she thought a person had to do to go to hell and whether or not a person had to be a good person um, to go to heaven. Montana said something interesting. She said, well, you know, I can't really tell who's bad and and who's good? Uh, again, a very non-committal answer, basically asserting that either she couldn't or wouldn't distinguish between right and wrong. And so I, I personalized it with her by creating a scenario in which someone very close to her was victimized. Now, I asked the question, do you have a good relationship with your mom and your dad? Uh, because I was going to use either her mother or her father as a victim, and I didn't want to get into too sensitive a territory if uh, if she didn't have a good relationship with one or the other. And here's where I made my mistake. It was an old, old piece of advice that that I've given people for years and years and years, and I didn't heed my own advice. I said, what if someone raped your mother? 
Now, I there's nothing wrong with personalizing a scenario using uh, a graphic scenario like a murder or something like that to uh, to paint a biblical picture of of right and wrong and justice. But I've always tried to avoid, especially when talking to ladies, avoid using the subject of rape. What I don't know about a stranger I'm talking to is whether or not she had been the victim of a rape or whether or not her mother had been a victim of a rape. And so usually what I do, and if you've listened to any of my conversations over the years, uh, oftentimes what I'll do is, what if someone... What if someone did something awful to someone you love? What if someone harmed someone you love? And and let them decide who that person is and let them in their mind decide what harm had come to the person they love. Uh, by keeping it uh, generic that way, I'm allowing them to draw from very real experiences if they want to or to paint a make-believe scenario in their own mind. Uh, but by by personalizing it the way I did and saying, you know, what if someone raped your mother? I could have been entering into an area that was just simply too personal, too painful, uh, could have derailed the entire conversation, uh, could have offended her, um, could have hurt her emotionally. And obviously that's not something I ever want to do uh, in a conversation. Fortunately, uh, in God's providence, She hadn't been the victim of a rape. Her mother hadn't been the victim of a rape. And so uh, I was allowed to get uh, beyond that. But, you know, for your own future reference, you who are listening, if you're going to use a courtroom analogy like I use so often, like I I will use here, like I used here with uh, Montana, uh, and you're going to uh, make either the person you're talking to the victim of a crime or you're going to pick someone close to them, a close relative, a sibling, a parent, a spouse, make them the victim of the crime. Um, Since you likely don't know anything about the person's personal history that you're talking to, if you're talking to a stranger on the street, don't run the risk of in trying to paint a graphic scenario that you touch something that's actually real uh, in that person's life and thus maybe hurt or offend them and lose the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to them. So um, I haven't I haven't made that mistake in many, many, many years. And uh, when I went back and listened to the audio of the conversation, I kind of did a double take, like, what? What did you say? <laughs> so that was a mistake um, that I made in this conversation, uh, one I hope not to make again. But going through that scenario, uh, taking taking Montana through that scenario, it became very obvious to her something I already knew, uh, that she could judge right and wrong, that she could judge good and evil. And I explained to her, you know, that the reason why people will either uh, have a hard time doing that or insist that they don't do that or can't do that is because uh, the person I'm talking to knows that if they assign good or evil to someone else, they're going to have to assign good or evil to themselves. It's hard for them to see evil in others because, you know, like Montana, she would have to see it in herself. And uh, as you would hear t- uh, later in the conversation, uh, there was some very specific evil in Montana's life um, that uh, that would come to the surface. Um, she did believe that God is good. I wanted to make sure to establish that point. And then I quickly took her through the law. And she agreed that breaking the law is bad. So all of this is is evidence to the reality that God has written his law, rather, on the heart of every human being. Every human being knows the difference between right and wrong according to God's moral perfect standard, which he has written on every human heart. Montana was no different. And I asked her, do good people break God's law? And she said no. And this was after Uh, after admitting to lying and stealing and taking God's name in vain and looking with lust and disobeying or dishonoring her parents. And so while Montana initially was hoping in her own goodness uh, to enter into heaven, Montana knew, like I know about myself, like you know about yourself, 
like every human being knows that according to God's standard, none of us are good. No one's good. Uh, she agreed that a good judge punishes lawbreakers. And then I asked her if she understood or if she knew what God did so that she would not have to spend eternity in hell as the just penalty for her sins against God. And this would be a theme throughout the conversation. Montana was constantly looking in the mirror, hoping to see something in herself that would commend her to God. So after taking her through the law, and after explaining what this good judge did by taking upon himself the punishment she rightly deserved for her law-breaking, I asked her, do you have any idea what God did so that you might not have to spend eternity in hell? And she answered with, with a question. She wasn't sure. She said, by repenting. Now, Montana would share with me toward the end of the conversation that she spends time uh, moving back and forth between three different churches. Uh, she probably has spent time in churches all of her life. She's heard about the word repenting. She has a, a misunderstanding of what that word actually means. But in asking that question of her and her answer, it showed me that she was still looking to herself. So we went back into the courtroom. And I explained to her that repentance doesn't exonerate anybody. And I said to her, confession never sets anyone free. It's just more evidence of guilt. You know, I, I did my very best as a gang and juvenile crime investigator with the Sheriff's Department um, many years ago to uh, encourage suspects to confess, to confess on tape, to confess in writing, to confess in detail their crime. Never gave them any promises that they would get off or uh, would not be prosecuted if they confessed. Um, but I always encouraged them to do that. And the reason I wanted them to confess uh, wasn't so that they would feel better about themselves. It was so that I would have more evidence against them in court. And that's one of the reasons uh, uh, Roman Catholicism is such a blasphemous, wicked religion. Because in that religious system, in that false religious system, is the notion that if adherence to that religion confess in a little black darkened box to a sinner in a robe on the other side of a veil, that somehow their sins are going to be forgiven, that somehow they will be exonerated for their sins if they will but confess them. Well, no, just like in a courtroom, simply confessing our sin doesn't do anything to exonerate us. It's just more evidence of our guilt. Now, granted, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, the Apostle John wasn't writing to unbelievers, trying to confess their sin to, uh, to get out of God's punishment. He was writing to believers. And as believers, we ought to confess to God, be in agreement, as it were, with God, that we have sinned against him and that we have broken his law, and we should live a life of uh, perpetual repentance. We should be uh, confessing and repenting and believing uh, every day of our life, every day of our life. Always important also, after communicating the law and the gospel, to determine if the person understood it. Uh, as uh, you heard in this conversation, as you will hear in many of my conversations, I take as much time as the person will give me to explain the law and the gospel. And sometimes it's several minutes of me talking before the person either interrupts or responds or I, or I ask for some kind of uh, indication as to whether or not they understood. And that's what I did with Montana. You know, do, you, do you understand what I'm telling you? And Montana didn't. She was still focused on bettering herself. So we went back to the courtroom again, uh, this time to explain that any attempt to bribe the judge with our own good works is only going to result in further conviction and punishment. Uh, after that, I um, explained the doctrine of adoption to Montana. And uh, I used the very real experience of uh, members of my family who are adopted uh, to explain that 
when God adopts a person through faith in Jesus Christ into his beloved family. He uh, gives them a new name, he gives them new clothes, and he gives them a new home. And so I'd encourage you, if uh, you found that analogy of adoption useful, to go back, listen to that, maybe maybe make some notes. Then I asked her, now what do you think? So several minutes before, I asked the question, you know, do you understand what I'm telling you? She didn't. Uh, we went back over uh, the gospel again. We went back over doctrine again. We went back into the courtroom a couple of times. And then I asked her, now what do you think? And now she says, I think we have to believe in Jesus. And so that was an important, important moment uh, in the conversation. I asked Montana the question I ask often, especially when people are giving some indication of understanding the gospel and a certain level of conviction, um, all of which, you know, I'm trying to discern by the sound of their voice, by the look in their eye, by their, you know, mannerisms and what have you, uh, not knowing for sure what's going on in the person's heart. You know, but I asked the question I often ask, Hannah, is there any sin in your life that you love so much that you're willing to die and spend eternity in hell so you can enjoy that sin here? And, uh, and she says, I don't want to die, but it's my sexuality. So now I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know if Montana was speaking about heterosexual promiscuity or if she was speaking about lesbianism or something else. We never got to a place in the conversation where she was specific about uh, the sexual immorality that she was engaged in, but she obviously felt a level of guilt and sorrow over that sin. And uh, it was clear that um, it wasn't a sin that she wanted to hold on to and risk eternity in hell but a sin that she knew was a sin, knew that it was wrong for her to engage in that kind of activity and wanted to move away from that. Uh, whether or not that was a worldly sorrow that'll lead unto death, or she was expressing some level of uh, genuine repentance leading unto life, um, I don't know. Don't know that for sure. Now, I wonder if you heard it. Um, it was about this point of the conversation about 37 and a half minutes or so into the conversation that someone drove by and shouted, Hail Satan. It seems as though any time, if not every time, I'm in any kind of substantial conversation, somewhere along the way, sometime during that conversation, someone's going to drive by, if I'm out on the streets, someone's going to drive by and shout, Hail Satan. And it used to really bother me. It used to really offend me when that happened during conversations. Um, but it really doesn't anymore. And the reason for that is, while it's certainly offensive, and while it is blasphemy against God and against my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is offensive, um, I see it as a good reminder to me in those instances I see it as a good reminder to me that there is a spiritual war going on all around me uh, in a realm that I cannot see uh, or perceive, uh, that there is a spiritual battle going on around me as I'm engaged in gospel ministry, uh, especially when I'm engaged with this fight, as it were, for the soul of the person um, in front of me. And so while I don't necessarily rejoice and I'm glad whenever someone shouts, Hail Satan. Um, my level of anger at those moments has been replaced with thankfulness, in a sense, to the Lord of the reminder that uh, that spiritual battle is real. And so I'm, I'm thankful in that sense uh, for those reminders. Again, it's not that I want to hear Hail Satan. I hear it almost every day of my life when I'm out in the streets. It's not that I want to hear that, but when I do hear that, I I count it as not a positive thing, but a good reminder that there's a spiritual war uh, going on around me. Um, and then I talked to uh, Montana about something very important, and that is counting the cost. Uh, the realization that if she repents and receives Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior, that it will likely cost her something. I don't know what, I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know where, uh, but considering 
the kind of sin that she uh, brought up uh, that involved in sexual immorality. Certainly, if she's part of the LGBT community, uh, genuine repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and leaving uh, that depravity uh, could certainly cost her relationships, friendships, could cost her uh, in different ways. Uh, but if she is going to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, then she has to be willing to count the cost. And that's it's important in our gospel conversations that we talk to people about that, that we talk to them about counting the cost. And then uh, I asked Montana if there was any reason why uh, she wouldn't repent and believe the gospel. And she said no. Whether or not she will, I don't know. Uh, but it's always encouraging to hear someone say no. There's no reason why I wouldn't repent and believe the gospel. And then I asked her what made her stop. Um, the reason I asked her that is because Matt and I were on uh, a relatively new corner for us as far as ministry. And it's one that doesn't really lend itself for people, for motorists in particular, to stop and talk. It's There's not really uh, a good place uh, to park unless you really know the area. There's a YMCA uh, not far from where we stand. There's a large parking lot there. But because of the general flow of traffic, you've got to drive all the way around a block uh, once you've seen us to get to that parking location. And you've got to be pretty committed to stop and talk if you're going to if you're going to park there. Plus, you also need to know that that parking is available there. Uh, and so it was really encouraging to us that Montana, who lives on the opposite side of the river, uh, lives in another state, lives in Illinois, came over the bridge, saw the cross that said stop and talk, and she found that parking lot. She was so determined to stop and talk to us that she took the time she needed to find a place to park and walk over to where we were so she could talk. And so that was a good reminder for me, an encouragement for both me and Matt, that if in God's providence he wants someone to stop and talk to us, they're going to stop. They'll find a way. They'll find a place to park. And while I want to make the, that as easy as possible uh, for motorists who are driving by, uh, if for some reason I'm in, area, in an area where uh, parking isn't real accessible, that's okay. If God wants a person to stop, they're going to stop and talk to me. Then, uh, as I was finishing my time with Montana and explaining to her, you know, that I cared about her as my neighbor, um, I explained to her that knowing the way of eternal life, having been forgiven of my sin and receiving salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, I would have to hate her to withhold the gospel from her. So a question I want to leave you with, something I want you, the listener, to consider today is, do you really love the lost? Or, if you're not engaged in evangelism, are you showing a literal hatred for the lost because you're withholding from them, whether friend or family member or stranger, you're holding from them the only message that can save them, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will let you answer that, but I hope you will seriously consider that. If you're not engaged in communicating the gospel to lost people, and it doesn't have to be the way I do it, and it doesn't have to be as much time of the day as I spend doing it, you should engage in evangelism according to the personality God has given you and in the environment and in the context of life where he has placed you. We're different people. Uh, but if you are not out there communicating the gospel to lost people some way and somehow, and you're holding on to this notion that you love the lost, is that actually true? Or might you be uh, suffering from some depraved indifference toward the lost because you're intentionally withholding from people the only message that will save their life, the gospel of Jesus Christ? All right. Well, hey, I hope you were encouraged by my conversation with Montana, and I hope that this Chalk Talk has been profitable for you as well. And we're out of time, and I will look forward to seeing you next time on the Street Fishing Podcast. And until then, my friends, let's go fishing. <music>
We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Street Fishing Podcast. The Street Fishing Podcast and Tony Miano's daily street evangelism efforts are ministries of Grace Fellowship Church in Davenport, Iowa. Grace Fellowship is a Reformed Baptist church that subscribes to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Visit the church's website at gracefellowshipqc.com. That's gracefellowshipqc.com. And for more information about Tony Miano's street evangelism ministry, including books, articles, videos, and audios, visit crossencountersmen.com. That's crossencountersmin.com. Until next time, and until the nets are full, let's go fishing.